we are going to get into the competition category, some of the main features that play here at Sundance. And we'll start it off with the one that we've probably seen the least of, the World Cinema Documentary Competition. We, we have all of these covered, but not a lot of them. A lot of us have seen all of them. Uh, we'll start it off with Captains of Zatari, which was a late addition to the festival after the festival pulled Inconvenient Indian. They had a slot to fill, and it went to this interesting film directed by Ali El Arabi. Two best friends, Mahmoud and Fauzi, live in the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan and have an underlying dream of becoming professional soccer players while facing the difficult reality of their lives. Despite being confined under dire conditions, they remain hopeful and practice day in, day out. When a world-renowned sports academy visits, they both have the chance to make their dreams come true. And this is kind of an interestingly constructed film in that, like Blood, Bloody Nose Empty Pockets last year, which was sh sorted into the U.S. documentary category, not a documentary. And this one also does not have uh, entirely documentary scenes. And there are some fictional elements. I think the the crux of the story is true, but there's some construction here in order to give it a really nice, clean narrative arc. And, you know, yes, that means that maybe it's parts are a little bit fictionalized, but ultimately it creates this really interesting story that, I found out I found it to be kind of like the refugee camp version of Hoop Dreams, right? Where the story of young men growing up with this uh with the sports dream giving them hope to, make to exit their circumstances and and the realities kind of coming crashing back in on them. So it's a pretty interesting story even if it doesn't necessarily have quite as much going on uh as Hoop Dreams did. I, I still thought this was very good. Uh, I, I agree with what you were saying. Did they ever say like what parts would have been fabricated? I guess or not. Or I I didn't catch the Q and A or anything, okay. so I don't know what the director there, said. Yeah, there are moments where it's like, oh, so y'all just not gonna stare at the camera. Yeah, there are some other docs where it's like, oh, this is one hundred percent a doc. People don't know uh, other than to look at the camera. There were some sequences there, but uh, you have to. I think a really big part of this documentary is taking the context of what is happening in and the refugee camp that they're in, and just knowing everything that's happening behind the scenes. They shot this over six years, right? These are kids who grow up together, and there's a beautiful match sequence between seeing them converse at the beginning and seeing them talk at the end and if you like you can only do this virtually see that final scene and then go back to the beginning and it's just like it's it's a beautiful comparison but just recognizing where they're in and this idea of they don't have a home yet you have people and you know more about soccer than i do from a global mm -hmm. side coming in to like get these refugee kids to play and believe in a global dream not the american dream but this global mm -hmm. dream that you can make it yeah but not so really so there's this kind of interesting subtext to the movie in that the world-renowned sports academy that uh, they get to visit is uh, Qatari Academy. And Qatar has just invested a lot of money into soccer because they're going to host the 2022 World Cup. But Qatar is also a kind of tiny country. And something you may not know if you host the World Cup is that your team automatically gets into the World Cup. So uh, Qatar needs to field... A World Cup quality team, one of the ways that they seem to be trying to do that is recruiting young people from many yeah. surrounding nations. Like uh -huh. and this, this bringing in these Jordan refugees who are 16 or 17 it's a little... is kind of in the hopes that one of them will inspire or lift their World Cup team to success in the future. So I, I think there's just all this other stuff happening around the margins of this documentary that. that's also really fascinating. Yeah. Um, in America, but... you have agents exploiting. Um, Poorer families, when they go to these colleges or high schools, right, trying to be like, hey, we could help your kid. Here, they don't have colleges. They go to refugee camps that are have 76,000 refugees in it instead. And that's the pool they're trying to pick out of. So uh, I thought it was very well shot. I think it was a very interesting story about these two friends. Again, not just trying to make it out for themselves. They're trying to make it out for their family. So crazy looking, bro. This is like just a whole backstory of these refugees is it's a catastrophe, man. <laughs> we as a world suck. Yeah. Absolutely. The next one up is Faya Dai, a Ethiopian U.S. co-production directed by Jessica Bashir about a spiritual journey into the highlands of Harar, immersed in the rituals of Kat, a leaf that Sufi Muslims chewed for centuries as religious medita part of religious meditations, and it's Ethiopia's most lucrative cash crop today. 
It's a striking looking documentary. None of us got the chance to see it, but luckily we are joined by Alina Montemayor. Woo! Thank you, Alina. Alina. Uh, Alina, can you could you tell us a little about Faya Dai? Your one line on Faya Dai, the only person on the team who saw it. It's it's beautifully shot. The cinematography is great. It is in uh, black and white. There's a lot of things that aren't translated, so I guess that's where my disconnection went through. I don't know what happened there. Zach, you also have stories about some of the subtitles. But um, I know it's more of like a feeling. <laughs> You're supposed to take this. It's supposed to be like an immersive uh, movie. I would give it another watch after I, you know, after finishing watching the first time. Now knowing that, I would give it another watch. But yeah. Obviously, you know. She was telling me because there's this whole basis around like it was it's not like a gum, right? It, it's a leaf. It's this leaf that they use. That they use and they chew it. Uh huh. And it's supposed to cause this like euphoric thing that they use as a meditation for. Um, and I'd have to look that up. Just yeah, to not but it's different stories. I think Cod's supposed to have like hallucinogenic properties of how it too. I could be them. wrong. Yeah, so I guess that was a probably a confusing part that when she was uh, screening it, but. Uh, this was one that we wanted to reach out for. I think they were done with links for this one, but this is one of the ones that I still yeah, want to catch because, yeah, we had some peers who really enjoyed this one. And it looked beautiful because we were getting ready to record uh, the LME yeah. streams, but that's one that I'm interested in catching in again. Yeah, I think we were hoping that this one would have won an award mm -hmm. so we could catch up with it, but uh, unfortunately it skipped through the cracks. But cool that Alina caught it uh, and definitely let us know if you caught it. Let us uh, know in the comments if it's worth keeping on the radar. Flea, definitely one worth keeping on the radar. Oh, we're there. Uh, it's directed by... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jonas Poor Rasmussen. Oh, Flea. Uh, about Amin, who arrived as an unaccompanied minor in Denmark from Afghanistan. Today, Amin is a successful academic and is getting married to his longtime boyfriend. But it's part of a secret that he hid for 20 years, which threatened to build the life he ruined... Uh, to ruin the life he I built. said that backwards. <laughs> Threatens to ruin the life he built. This was the grand jury prize winner in the World Cinema Documentary Competition. It's a documentary, but it is entirely animated, which gives it a very interesting quality in that the animations are able to recreate scenes which we obviously would not have had access to, moments from uh, Amin's early life in Afghanistan and parts from his attempted immigrations from different countries it really helps put you in the moments and recreates the stunning life art what did you think about flea it was the only one that expired on me and y'all kept <laughs> hyping up this, this sequence that happens towards the latter half of the film and i was like damn mm -hmm. i'm not gonna get the chance to see it because just the way that the streaming things work once it's up it's up you don't get a chance to see it again alina had loved this movie she kept typing it up we had a, a couple of other people who had seen it as well um and i know that there were some criticisms but when i finally got the chance to see it it was one o'clock in the morning and it appeared on my <laughs> screen i clicked that bad boy immediately the second half hits you with so many moments that had me <laughs> sniffling <laughs> making sure that i didn't break um and I found it absolutely fascinating. I want to compare it to something we discussed on Intercut previously in another Sundance feature from last year called Welcome to Chechnya, a movie that also mm. covered, you know, to a degree, refugees, uh, specifically because of homosexuality being banned uh, in Russia, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. But the use of AI and the facial shift that they were able to do in that movie I found that technique fascinating in that film as they're trying to hide their identities. And in this film, they use animation to be able to tell his story mm -hmm. and all the things that he went through, not just as someone who was running away, but someone who was also dealing with their own identity. And it floored me. I thought it was fantastic. Riz Ahmed is a producer mm -hmm. on this, as well as uh, King Jamie. And they are both going to be doing the English dubs, I want to say. I don't think they're going to be redoing the entire mm -hmm. film, uh, but they will be doing the English versions of these uh, of this film. Interesting. Picked up by Neon. It's going to be mm -hmm. very interesting to see if it goes to theaters or to Hulu. But I think this is Hulu realizing what Netflix has known for the longest time. Netflix dubs everything that they do. Not just a voiceover like Speed Racer. They make sure mm -hmm. that it tries to fit as close to the lips as possible. Mm -hmm. That's why Netflix is number one. I think everybody else is realizing that, and they're going to be dubbing a lot more things. And, uh, hey, look, I'm one who always says subs over dubs, and I, I think that that's very effective, but I also understand that for some people it works a little bit better, and it will reach more people having an yeah. English version of it as well. Uh, I think everyone should check this one out. I think that we will be talking about this one for 
a year to come yeah. for sure, and years to come. They presented it as a classic when they gave it the award, nice. and I agree. I mean, did you get to catch this one? No, mm. I didn't. Yeah. So, yeah, this was one that Neon snapped up immediately. I mean, I think it struck a chord with a lot of people. Yeah. So it's it's definitely going to be. Uh, I'm very excited to see yeah. it. Uh, I, you know, it's obviously a really amazing story. Uh, there's a border crossing sequence that happens about halfway through the movie that is just like riveting stuff, puts you on the edge of your seat and makes you uh, vicariously feel the worry of the people in that moment. And, you know, it, it's weird because I really like the fact that this is animated because it is able to really give you a, a feel for the place in a lot of ways. But I don't know if I loved all of the animation. There's like a, a, uh, okay. a slow quality to some of how the animation moves that took me out of different parts. But it's it's an undeniably fascinating story. Really well told. I, I was like you in tears by the end. So... I can. Bro, it's a highly it, recommended it, I don't know film spoiler. for me. Yeah. Damn. Have you all seen Tower? No. Is this the same guy who did Tower? No, but it's uh, again oh. that idea of allow all of these documentaries being able to use animation. I was curious to see what you thought of the animation in right. that one or Walt with Bashir. Yeah, uh, li I like Walt with I Bashir. I think. Yeah. So. It's up there. Well, I think we're having this whole animated documentary category. Mm -hmm. uh, we're gonna need two animation categories at Sundance right. and at the Oscars very soon. <laughs> All right, let's move on to another movie that was a big pickup during the festival, Misha and the Wolves, snapped up by Netflix. Yes. Directed by Sam Hobkinson. This is a story about a woman's Holocaust memoir that takes the world by storm, <laughs> but f the fallout that comes from her publisher turned detective as she reveals the story behind the audacious deception created to hide a darker truth. <laughs> I think anybody who saw this movie could tell you that Netflix was going to be all over it, not just because it plays into that true crime genre that does so well on the service, but also in the way that this movie is produced, it looks like mm -hmm. a Netflix movie in the in the design of it, in the mm -hmm. the way that scenes are photographed. It uh, it's almost yeah. remarkable that Netflix didn't produce this one. It's obviously a fascinating. No, we didn't hear the don. <laughs> it's obviously a very <laughs> fascinating story. I, I think it's you know. One of the benefits of documentary is like the un if you pick an underlining story that's amazing, it's going to be riveting no matter what. So I was yeah. uh, compelled by this film. But there's a couple of choices that they but. make that I was really yes, frustrated with that kind of uh -huh. took me out of the documentary in certain ways. They're kind of lying about a central element of this story or, or at least the story as they portray it that. I kind of found completely unnecessary and almost took my took the wind out of my sails as I was getting to the back, back end of this movie. So I want to recommend it because it is an interesting story, but I, I just didn't love how they made it. I'd recommend it too. And exactly what you're saying, that's when I knew that this was going to be a Netflix pickup because <laughs> if there's one company yeah. who doesn't give a yep. damn about it being straight to the facts and that, it yeah. would have been dumb. Amanda, did you get the chance to catch this one? I did, yeah. This was the one that I was all like... My mom would like yep. this, and I mean that in a nice way. My mom watches a lot of like identif like like ident identification discovery type stuff, like ID yeah. discovery. Oh, this a lot is of crime there. stuff. She's gonna love it. So yeah, yeah. But Zach's right. There's that discussion because the director wanted to pitch this not just as a doc but a psychological thriller. Mm -hmm. And considering the subject matter, it's kind of like censor. We want to yeah. make a movie about the importance of what happens when you see this much imagery um, while creating a movie that creates that imagery. So yeah. The interesting creative choices that were given. Some I actually do like, mm -hmm. without spoiling. Uh, I thought they did a fascinating job at maybe duping the audience to that degree. But when you compare it to what the story is supposed to be, it's going to have a very interesting reception and a global reception because Netflix is going to be picking it up. Absolutely. So let's move on to The Most Beautiful Boy in the World. It's a Swedish documentary about the actor slash musician, musician Bjorn Andersson, whose life was forever changed at 18 when he was cast to play Tadjo, the object, object of story. obsession in Death of Venice, Crazy. a role which uh, hmm. led Lucino Visconti to dub him the most beautiful boy in the world. And it tells his life story and the fallout from being given such an illustrious title at such an early <laughs> age. It, it is a very sad documentary about this guy's life and the many ways in which forcing this identity onto somebody, especially so young, 
can f- la- have lasting impacts on their development and ability to function uh, it regularly in society. I think it's an interesting story, albeit not one that goes many places beyond that first feeling. Uh, but I still want to recommend this one, but for a very weird reason. Yeah. Uh-huh. And that's because we get behind uh, we'll, the scenes we'll get, we'll footage we'll, of yeah. Midsommar. Yeah. <laughs> that's the thing this thing was filmed over five years that's and amazing. a lot of people didn't know and everyone's realizing it when there's a trailer out about it as well that he is the older elder in midsomar i love uh, that and if you know anything about midsomar they released this in multiple different ways but they have not given you behind the scenes this is the <laughs> first time we get some behind the scenes so that was really dope to see that with it being filmed over five years and it telling his story uh with him in the present and then a lot of stuff that happens behind the scenes that's right it's not that it doesn't go anywhere it just continues to get sadder and sadder and sadder the more you learn about every relationship not just professionally but even within his own personal life and it's like damn it's really sad (laughs) so uh it's a downer of a movie but it is a compelling story of his life so uh if you're interested uh, another thing it wasn't as personal to me i mean the midsummer one stood out to us but he also was a singer and i believe over in asia he was a big inspiration for a style of animation over Mm -hmm. there oh wow and because, yeah, it's supposed to be like, again, he's a really beautiful boy, but he also kind of has like feminine features to him. Yeah. So that was like a really big push for a, a style of animation that they had back in the day. And oh, that to a lot of people was very surprising. We're surprised he was in Midsommar. People yeah. surprised he was inspiration for that. A crazy story that he has behind him. Yeah, that's crazy. Bit a sad one. Very yeah. sad. All right, we're going to need Alina again for this next one, the Australian documentary Playing with Sharks, written and directed by Sally Aitken. It's about Valerie Taylor is a shark fanatic and Australian icon, a marine maverick who forged her way as a fearless diver, cinematographer, and conservationist. She filmed the real sharks for Jaws and famously wore a chainmail suit using herself as shark bait, changing our scientific understanding of sharks forever. Really compelling idea. I was hoping to catch this one uh but it it was hard to it was again one of those early movies that slipped through the cracks luckily we have a screener link so i think we're going to catch up with it soon but i know alina yeah. did get mm-hmm. to watch it so yeah alina what'd you think what'd you think of uh playing with sharks because yeah we did i'm going to catch it extre- right after this yeah, i'm going to get it but uh oh okay um she's going to vanna white me right here <laughs> alina thought playing with sharks which is about an australian diver and filmmaker valerie taylor uh who helped with jobs this is everything <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just take off. So again, this is one I guess that has a lot of archives. It, it's all her archives. So she took a lot of pictures, and then the man she married, like he was a photographer. So like all. Oh, this sounds like Whirly so, Bird. So the last thing I have on there, which I I hope Zach didn't know. Zach did, <laughs> did not say that he trained a shark for the perfect shot near some coral. Yes. So she was trying to get her perfect shot framed. She's like, "Well, I need the shark to be over here by the squirrel. Okay. Because the sun's gonna hit in a certain way that I love. She's like, "Okay, so I'm gonna start training it now." And she would try to feed it fish, kind of like how you train a dog. And you're like, "I'm not gonna give you a treat unless oh, yeah. you do something for me." And she trained the shark, and she claims that sharks are smarter than dogs. Well, there you have it. I will say this movie is harder to catch than the shark, that's for sure. So uh, hopefully it's still available once we're done recording here. But it, it was, uh, yeah, this is the hardest one to, to catch at the festival. But it has the most intriguing premise. The woman who worked on Jaws, like, yeah. That's so. awesome. Hey, Zach from the future here, just jumping in to say that I caught up with Playing With Sharks after we recorded our whole Sundance thing. And it's a really interesting documentary. I found it fascinating uh, talking about Valerie Taylor, who's kind of this almost Steve Irwin-ish figure. I don't know if I'm only saying that because she's Australian too. But the way in which the documentary dives into so many assumptions around sharks and shows... Some of the ways that we arrived there, how responsible Jaws was in creating some of the ideas around our fear of sharks, and also how culpable the people at the center of this film feel for in their desire to promote uh, knowledge of sharks and images of sharks, they ended up creating this a false idea of what they are. I thought it was a really interesting documentary, not just a profile of this amazing person, but looking into uh, an animal that we all have a fascination with in some way or another. So yeah, I would highly recommend playing with sharks whenever this one becomes more widely available. Now let's get back to the rest of the world documentary competition movies. One of the best documentaries from this category, President. 
from Camilla Nielsen, who previously directed the documentary Democrats. This is about Zimbabwe during Bro. the 2018 mm-hmm. Zimbabwean presidential election uh, after the opposition leader Nelson Chamisa challenges the old guard Emerson Managua, uh, known as the crocodile. The election tests both the ruling party and the opposition. How do they interpret principles of democ- democracy and discourse and in practice? The, the thing about presidents is, as an American, I'm cursed with the inability to take in a foreign story without viewing it through the lens of how it reflects America, right? So th- this is a documentary yeah. with so many weird similarities to, to what we've been going through, whether that's contesting ballots or being upset at 2 a.m. that we don't know the official results <laughs> of presidential election or you know, all these little things that... Propaganda. <laughs> that, that make it just uh, feel weird uh, in, in how it mirrors our own uh, situation, but it's its own fascinating story with all of these incredible characters and twists and turns and really just horrifying miscarries miscarriages of justice throughout uh, it's a really interesting movie it got the special jury award for verite filmmaking because it really does kind of yes yeah, so about put to say you that. on it as a fly in the wall in the room of all these very important people as you watch a coup happen in slow motion mm-hmm. yeah there's also a coup in this movie it, mm-hmm. it's a fascinating documentary i it, it was one of the longer ones of the festival but for me i i was riveted the it entire time yeah Yo, the uh, this bad boy. I'm trying to even see if I have the time over here. It I know like it's two stretched hours, over the two hour mark, or something like that. Yeah, it was yeah. <laughs> but yeah. it had a lot. Yes, as long as Sparks Brothers. But it had a lot to say. This is up there with Mayor. Mm-hmm. It's got the practically the length of City Hall. <laughs> the charisma this man had, man. He had me rooting for him. You had told me about that Obama line <laughs> that he says. This is a man who was really trying to gather everyone together, and it definitely deserved the award special jury for Verite because there is a certain sequence where it's not just all of the rooms where things are happening that they're, they, they, they get they get access to, but there is bloodshed in this movie. Mm-hmm. And the camera is shooting right alongside the guns being fired as well. Mm-hmm. This is a doc. This is a documentary. Um, I don't know what yeah. else to say. Uh, I have a quote from him. Change is coming. It can be delayed but it cannot be denied. And I've been going mm, so many times with this. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with what Zach's saying. Just like in the same breath, it's a lot of reminders going America <laughs> with a mirror. Not yeah. really. America. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, even besides that, it's just very interesting to see what's going on over there in Zimbabwe and the way that they're going uh, and handling their, their their politics and just the people being fed up. Yep. Simple as Absolutely. that. All right, Sabaya, the Swedish documentary from Hogir Hirori, with just a mobile phone and a gun, Mahmoud, Ziyad, and their group risk Mm -hmm. their lives trying to save Yazidi women and girls being held by ISIS as Sabaya abducted sex slaves in the most dangerous camp in the Middle East, Ihol in Syria. This was the World Documentary Award winner for directing art. Will you? I think you're the only one of us who caught this one. What did? No, I saw. Oh, it. Amanda. Well, we haven't heard from yeah. Amanda for a think? while. What do you think about? Yeah, it's Zabaya? been a little while. I just, you know, I went and ate a burrito and everything, but I'm back. Uh, <laughs> I thought just the this is one of those ones that feels more like investigative journalism than than a documentary, mm. and I mean that in a good way. It's not a bad thing at all because it's just like this. I can't imagine putting yourself in that kind of situation yeah. to like to save these girls and it is so heartbreaking like w- the ways some of them react when when they're taken out and like how they they absolutely would have killed themselves had they had the means to before getting rescued and it's just like they, he, they're so jaded or just casual about like the war-torn lands they live in like there's gunfires going off and they'll just kind of be like do you have your gun? You Maybe we should potentially, you should probably have your gun here, I mm. guess. It's just so, it's it's just so um, just alien to, to like our way of mm-hmm. life. Like we, we know that there's a lot of different sex trafficking stuff that goes on here, but this is like a next level where there's these organized camps that are, are accessible and it's, it's able to thrive due to these, you know, these war torn areas. Yeah, it's a hard watch uh, when you really think about the larger implications of what's going on there. 
Yeah. Yeah. Everything she said. Cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so uh, seems like a worthy winner of the directing prize from this category. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Taming the Garden, directed by Salome Jashi. It's a poetic ode to the rivalry between men and nature. Art, you told me this was kind of like a meditative, slow, but fascinating doc. Tell me a little more about it. They knocked it out of the park with this one. This should have won cinematography. I didn't mm. see that many cinematography awards this no. time around. Um, right? One. Last year, what won the cinematography one? Uh, A Casa My Home, I believe. Mm. A Casa My Home was a beautiful tale about getting a family out of nature and putting them into what they call the concrete jungle. This is the opposite story. It's not following humans. It's following mm. a tree being displaced from its home and taken somewhere else. Obviously, you get it from all the surroundings of the people there. There is a woman who planted this tree when she was 25 years old. She's 90. They're promising roads that they'll build in exchange for the tree. They're lying. Mm. It's just talking about how like a, a lot of displacement, not just dealing uh, with the you know agriculture that they have over there, but the way that it's shot, like you said, it is a poetic tale where you're following this tree. It's like think of the, the giving tree <laughs> where you're following the story of it being uprooted and displaced. Like, I don't know. I found that thing absolutely fascinating it kind of reminds me of um uh zach well, gunda oh good where oh, instead okay. of animals who you're just observing you're observing this tree with all the bickering that's going on from everybody wanting to have different decisions on this you know because i will never see another tree that you know is uprooted because it's got the little mulch around it oh, yeah. the same way again without thinking damn you were taken away from your home <laughs> 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 it is patient it has shots that last about 30 seconds to 45 seconds. I found every single one beautiful. If you have the time to watch a documentary that's going to take its time, I think this one packs a punch about a tree being displaced. Uh, very well done. Very well done. I, this, I, I was yeah. hoping this would get like a cinematography nod yeah. or something because, again, it told the story very well just like Akasa did. Yeah, this is one of the few that I'm kicking myself over not uh, having gotten the chance to actually watch. So... Hopefully yeah. we'll get to catch up with mm -hmm. it soon. But the last one we have in the world documentary category is Writing with Fire out of India, directed by mm -hmm. Rintu Thomas and Shushmit Ghosh. It is the audience award winner for world documentary, as well as the special jury award winner for Impact for Change. I think it's a fitting award for this movie, which is about India's only newspaper run by Dalit women. Armed with smartphones, Chief, Chief reporter Mira and her journalists break traditions on the front lines of India's biggest issues and within the confines of their own homes, redefining what it means to be powerful. It's a really interesting documentary uh, about these women who are from the these lower caste these lower caste groups in India traditionally thought mm. of as, you know, lower, uh, you know, the lower parts of society, the, traditionally not given the best places to live or the best accommodations or sometimes any education at all, suddenly becoming these reporters. You know, there's these scenes oh, in this film of women being, being need to taught how to operate a smartphone, yet they go on to edit together a whole news package and put it up on their YouTube channel. And in just oh, wow. watching uh, this documentary put together their, their news organization's growth and all the actual impact that they have as a news organization on helping fix roads for villages, helping get clean uh, well water to different places, uncovering uh, rape cases that don't get the attention attention of police. I think it's a fascinating showcase for journalists doing good, like the reason why we need journalists in society. And I think, you know, mm -hmm. India is a country that is in the midst of different issues when it comes to either their current uh, political landscape or the situation for women dealing with sexual violence that you yeah. need good reportage on these issues uh, to, to get anything done. And I think it's a great documentary because it really shows the hard work that goes into these st uh, stories and also how difficult it is sometimes for the people who are most affected by these stories to actually have a voice in getting their stories told. So yeah, it's definitely Amazing. one of the standouts for a world documentary to me. I hope more people get to catch writing with fire. Oh, wow. I'm excited. Sweet. We got the link. I'm going to try to catch yeah. it. 